Okay, let us uh, let's pick back up where we left off last Wednesday. So, what's on the agenda for today? I want to spend the first part of class today finishing up our discussion of stochastic control. And then we're going to begin our discussion of the stochastic optimal growth model, sometimes referred to as the Brock Merman model. And we should spend probably three or so class periods on that before finishing and then we'll be at our last topic for the semester. Okay. Um, so what I want to do for the first part of class today is to establish the result the kind of analog result in a stochastic environment whereby the solutions to the stochastic dynamic programming problems can be fully characterized by two conditions. One is the stochastic Euler equations, right, derived from the first order condition of the Bellman equation and the envelope conditions. And the other is a stochastic version of the transversality condition. What you guys are going to be expected to be able to do in practice is when you're faced with a stochastic dynamic optimization problem to be able to characterize the solution to it. I'm not going to ask you to prove the dynamic programming theorems. So that means be able to write down the Euler equations and the transversality condition. What do those look like in a world that has uncertainty? And then we'll apply these tools to the Brock Merman model starting today. Okay, so here is our Bellman equation in the general stochastic control world. The value for the function for the planner is equal to the maximum of this two part term here, the current return, which depends on the state X, the control X prime and the realization of the shock Z, plus the discounted conditional expectation of the continuation return given by the value function scrolled forward one period. You have to take a conditional expectation because that value function depends on tomorrow's realization of the shock Z prime, which is unknown. We do know what distribution it is drawn from. It's a first order Markov process. So we can evaluate this conditional expectation given what we know about the state of the world today, that is Z. So the planner is effectively, instead of selecting an infinite sequence of state contingent plans is basically choosing a policy function X prime, which tells the, 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 the planner how the control is going to be selected as a time invariant function of the state and the current realization of the shock. Um, and this Bellman equation, of course, applies for any possible feasible value of the state X and for any realization of the shock Z. Now, we've gone over all of those assumptions that establish equivalency between the sequence problem and the functional equation or the recursive form of this problem. All of that stuff holds, right? In particular, the value function is gonna be strictly concave and differentiable with respect to the interior of its domain. So we can use first order conditions to this problem to characterize the solution. They're both necessary and sufficient, okay? So let's do that. Let's take the first order conditions to this problem. So if we were to take the derivative of the Bellman equation with respect to X prime, how does it look? Well, we would have the gradient of U with respect to the second set of arguments. Plus the discount factor times the expected value of the gradient of the value function with respect to the first K arguments or the or the or the state so V X prime Z prime conditional on Z is equal to zero. This equation must hold for the optimal value of the control X prime, which I'm denoting X prime star. And importantly, this must be true for all 
Z in big Z. Everybody understand the notation there? And now remember, derivatives are linear operators, correct? So you can take the expected value is the integral of a random variable times its dis probability density function, right? You can take the derivative through the integral. So when, I, when we differentiate the Bellman equation, you, the, the derivative of the expectation is the same as the expectation of the derivative, right? So there sh should be no um, confusion there. Um, now, one, one thing I want to emphasize here that is important for you guys to understand. So the, these are the stochastic Euler equations. There, there should be, now in, the, in the deterministic case, how many of these Euler equations were there? Well, the number of Euler equations corresponds to the size of the control, right? In the, in the basic R, uh, uh, growth model that we talk about, the control is just the capital stock. So it was one Euler equation. That is still true here, but there's something extra. And that is that Euler equations must hold for every possible realization of the current value of the shock. In other words, the, the, the Euler equations here must hold for all states of the world. In other words, regardless of what the current realization of the shock is, these Euler equations must hold. And so how many elements are there in big Z? Capital N, remember? So in other words, there's essentially N different Euler equations here, one for each possible realization of Z. So make sure you guys understand that. In the stochastic world, these Euler equations must hold at all states of the world. And so there are, there are as many Euler equations as there are different possible realizations of the random shock in any given period, which is capital N in our model. Okay, now the stochastic Euler equations are of course not sufficient to solve the optimal policy function, why? because the Euler equations themselves depend on the value function, which is determined implicitly in the optimization problem. So we have to employ a trick or a tool in order to eliminate the value function from those set of conditions, enabling us to solve for the policy function. And what is that trick or tool? It is the envelope condition, right? And what does the envelope condition look like in this stochastic world? You guys help me out with that. It's the derivative of the value function with respect to the state is equal to what? It's the derivative of the Bellman equation with respect to X evaluated at the optimal policy function X prime star. So it would be the gradient with respect to the first capital K arguments of U X X prime star Z. And that's it. Now you'll note, and, and again, this must hold for all possible values of Z. So just like there are capital N stochastic Euler equations, there are capital N envelope conditions that match those. We're going to use all of them to eliminate the value function term from the Euler equation. Now, one thing I'll point out here, notice that there are no expectations in the envelope condition. Why? Because we, um, when we take the derivative with respect to the state, we're looking at the current period. That's right. The equation is conditioned on a, per, a particular realization of the shock Z, which we already know at the beginning of the planning period, right? So we, there are no expectations, conditional or unconditional, in the envelope um, uh, condition. Very good. All right. Now, if all of those assumptions hold that we talked about in the last class, then the various dynamic programming theorems will apply, which means that 
the policy function x prime star can be written as a time invariant mapping from x product z into x. Looks like the following, all right? For all x on big X and all z on big Z. All right, given that information, what I'd like to do then is use the, on, the envelope condition in order to derive an expression for this value function term that we can substitute into the Euler equation. Well, you'll notice that the envelope condition says that the gradient with respect to x of bxz should be equal to the gradient with respect to the first argument of u of x x prime star is just pi of x z. If we scroll this thing forward one period, this implies that the gradient with respect to the first k arguments of v x prime z prime should be equal to the gradient with respect to the first k arguments of u of x prime, which is pi of x z, x double prime, the optimal value of x two periods from now. So that would be what? Pi of pi of x z comma z prime comma z prime. We can then use this information to plug it into the stochastic Euler equation to find that the gradient with respect to the second set of arguments, u of x pi x z z plus the beta times the expected value then of the gradient of the value function scrolled one period ahead would be the gradient with respect to the first set of states, u pi of x z, pi pi of x z z prime, comma z prime, conditional on z is equal to zero for all z in big Z. And there are your stochastic Euler equations. They now depend only on the utility function, but we've transformed this problem that was characterized as a functional equation in V into a functional equation in pi. And the object then is to be able to solve for the time invariant policy function pi from this set of stochastic Euler equations. There are again n of them to match the n different possible values of the current realization of the state of the shock z. So the stochastic Euler equations must hold for all states of the world. Now, if I were to use, if I were to, to transform this equation back into its um, sequence version, what would it look like? The gradient with respect to the second k arguments in the utility function, u of x tilde star of z superscript t minus 1. So that's the optimal value then of xt, x tilde star superscript um, uh, as a function of z superscript t and then z subscript t plus beta times um, the expected value the gradient with respect to the first k arguments in the utility function of the whole thing scrolled forward one period conditional on, on the known realization of the shock at date t 
is equal to zero. This must hold for all z t minus one in big Z t minus one, and for all z subscript t in z, and for all t bigger than or equal to zero. In other words, the stochastic Euler equations must hold at all states and at all dates. So the, the fundamental difference between the Euler equations, the intertemporal Euler equations in the deterministic world and the ones here is that in the, in the former, the, the intertemporal Euler equations only need to hold at all dates of time. But here, they must hold not only at every period T, but also for every possible realization of the shocks over time. Any possible history of Zs that could play out, the intertemporal Euler equations have to hold in conditional expectation. So that, that's, what, that's what we mean by them holding at all dates and all states. Okay, y'all have questions about that? Now, you'll recall that um, the Euler equations are not sufficient for characterizing the solution to these optimal control exercises. There is another condition that is, that is essential in order to fully characterize them, and that is the transversality condition. What does the transversality condition look like in stochastic form? Well, what does it say in general? What's the transversality condition in a, in a fully perfect foresight model say? You guys should know this by now. It's the present value of the marginal utility of the state has to asymptotically approach zero as time goes to infinity. Right, so the discounted value beta to the t times the marginal utility value of the state in these problems has to limit to zero. Okay, well, something similar to that has to hold in the stochastic world, except it's obviously only going to hold in conditional expectation because we don't know what particular sequence of shocks is going to play out over time, right. So the transversality condition in this world is the limit as t goes to infinity of beta to the t, that's the present value of the expectation of the marginal value of the state. So that's the derivative of the period payoff function with respect to the state evaluated again at the optimal sequence of state contingent plans. times the value of the state, which would be x tilde star z superscript t minus 1. And this is an inner product because we're dealing with a k-dimensional vector here. All of that conditional on the known value of the shock in the initial period z0. This term has to approach, has to go to 0. So you'll notice here that unlike the stochastic Euler equations, there's only one transversality condition. And that's because the expectation is formed based on information known at the beginning of time. Okay? It's not conditioned on every possible realization of the shock, again, every single period, period after period. And so there's only one transversality condition, even though there's capital N stochastic Euler equation. But this must hold in conditional expectation. As you might imagine, in a economic setting with stochastic terms, the transversality condition is going to be equivalent to a lifetime budget constraint being respected in equilibrium. That is the present value of lifetime consumption 
which will depend on whatever sequence of shocks plays out over time, cannot exceed the present value of lifetime labor earnings, which will also depend on whatever sequence of shocks plays out over time. So that lifetime budget constraint has to hold an expected value. The transversality condition similarly has to hold an expected value. Okay, that leads us essentially to theorem eight, which I'm not going to write down. I'm just going to state because I don't think I need to write anything else down. But essentially what this means is if I've, it, it, theorem eight says the following, that if I give you guys an optimal sequence problem that has some type of stochastic component to it, like a random productivity shock, that all you need to do to characterize the solution to that dynamic programming problem is two things. To have the stochastic Euler equations, one, along with the transversality condition. These two conditions together fully characterize the evolution of this infinite sequence of optimal state contingent plans for the control. Which, because of the equivalence between the sequence problem and the Bellman equation, can be represented as a time invariant policy function, pi over the state x and the random shock z. Right, so the state X is compact. All of those assumptions hold. And this, this sequence of state contingent plans is optimal as long as it satisfies both the intertemporal stochastic Euler equations at all dates and all states, as well as the transversality condition. Okay, being able to derive the set of intertemporal Euler equations will be the first step to characterizing the solution to the brock merman model. Being able to verify that the transversality condition holds will be how we verify that we've indeed found the optimal policy function for the brock merman model. Doing that requires that you guys be able to set up the right Bellman equation, identify the states and controls, write the Bellman equation in terms of conditional expectations properly, identify the right constraint correspondence, take first order conditions and envelope conditions and use them to derive the intertemporal Euler equations correctly. Okay. You guys have any questions then about that? Again, the, the, the idea here is not to go over all of the high powered mathematics, the analysis and the measure theory necessary to, to prove all of these dynamic programming theorems in a stationary stochastic environment. You, if any of you guys wanna go on and, and do macroeconomics professionally, you'll likely have to encounter that material at some point. But the idea here is to, is to help you guys become practitioners of these basic dynamic programming applications okay all done